Hi, in this review video I take a look at one of the newer members of the Cadus family, the Cadus Edge and the Cadus Captain. This board has some pretty interesting power management and unfortunately I saw the return of the Magic Smoke Genie. And yes, this video is being sponsored by JLC PCB. If you want some quick turnaround prototype PCBs, then I highly recommend them. They can produce one to six layer boards from 0.4 to two millimeters thick, with track width down to 0.01 millimeters and support BGAs, cutouts, fingers. If you want to check out all their capabilities, then click on the link below. They've just recently reduced their prices substantially for multi-layer boards and are currently offering 10 PCBs for only two bucks. Also, if you're a first time customer, you'll get $20 off shipping off your first order. That's pretty cool. So before I get started, there's several things to note. Firstly, full disclosure here, I normally purchase SPCs myself, but uh, Cadus sent me review units of the Edge, Captain, and also the Vim 2. However, like all my reviews, I say it the way I see it. Secondly, a while back, Cadus reached out to a couple of primary developers and reviewers of SPCs to ask for feedback on how they could improve things. This is a pretty good sign that they want to listen to makers and not just shove something onto the market. I gave some fairly lengthy feedback and it looks like they've taken some of this advice on board with the Cadus Edge. Thirdly, this is a pre-release SPC with an Indiegogo campaign currently still running. So some things are a bit rusty and some things may change. So like my previous Latte Panda and Nano PCT reviews, I'll have to have a part one and part two and more than likely a part three because there's so much to cover on this particular SPC. This video, I'll be looking at all the low level stuff like GPIOs, chips used, and also the overall design of the board. The Cadus Edge comes as a small footprint SPC with an edge connector, allowing you to use it standalone or with a baseboard. This makes it a fairly compact, low profile board, possibly taking the title of the thinnest. It can be used with or without the baseboard and breaks out a ton of GPIOs onto an edge connector. This definitely gives the Edge the title of most GPIOs accessible on an SPC. So first looking at the Edge, what do you get? Starting from the top right and working clockwise, we have USB 2.0 connector, PWM based fan control, reset button, function button which allows selecting boot mode, power button, 314 pin header giving you way more GPIOs than any other SPC, IPEX Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectors, USB 3.0, USB Type-C, HDMI 2.0, another USB Type-C and a USB 2.0 port. Then there's 16 gig EMMC on board, 2 gig RAM and the 6 core RK3399 SOC. Interestingly, the board can be powered from either of the USB Type-C ports, automatically switching between either of them. Two buck converters providing 5 volts and 3.3 volts. Both buck converters can handle up to 28 volts DC input and supply up to 8 amps continuous and 10 amps maximum. They have automatic load regulation, soft start and over voltage, over current and over everything else protection. Then there's the Rockchip RK808 PMIC, which handles all the voltages to the CPU core. It has four DC buck converters, eight linear regulators, two MOSFET switches, and all controlled over ITC. Then there's the Realtek Gigabit Transceiver. And as you'll see, there's a heck of a lot of crystals on this board. A couple of unknowns, either some MOSFETs or Chinese spy chips. 64 megabit quad SPI flash from Windbond, and interestingly, an STM8S003, which handles all the logic over wake on LAN, PMIC power, reset and booting, LEDs, buttons, and infrared. As we'll find out later, this is accessible on one of the I2C buses and acts as both a master and slave. Another couple of crystals, yet again and a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth module based on the ineffable AP6356S. Interestingly, the schematic says it should be the AP6398S, so I'm gathering that these are interchangeable, 
but couldn't find any data sheets on that module. Then there's some USB EST protection, line filter, and load switch with adjustable current limit from 100 milliamps to 1.7 amps. Six channel ESD protection for one of the USB type C ports and yet another line filter. And pretty sure these are some P channel MOSFETs. Meanwhile, on the dark side of the board, we have two FPC connectors for GPIO expansion. And not much else besides a few more six channel ESD protection for the USB 3.0 port a few more unknowns and a 28 volt 3.9 amp load switch with all sorts of over voltage over current protection. Another load switch for the USB port with adjustable current limit. Programmable USB type C controller with PD and accessible on the I2C bus. Some more six channel ESD protection for the USB type C port. And then the same for the other USB type C port. Moving on to the captain, we have user accessible button on the corner, 40 pin GPIO header, which is absolutely not Pi compatible for so many reasons. Reset button, which mirrors the one on the edge, 12 volt DC jack, SD card slot, some buttons to mash, display port connector, touch panel interface, some more buttons to mash, two MIPI CSI and one MIPI DSI connector, audio jack, function button mirroring the edge, MKM3 edge connector, another user accessible button, and gigabit ethernet port. And splattered throughout the board, we have a few interesting semiconductors, gigabit isolation coils, a buck boost battery charge controller supporting multiple battery chemistries. It can provide a steady 4.48 to 20.8 volt DC output at up to 6.35 amps from a 3.5 to 24 volt DC input. The output is fully USB 2.0, 3.0 and type C PD compatible and has all the usual protection circuitry you would expect these days. You can select the DC buck oscillator frequency from 800 kilohertz to 1.2 megahertz, but gathering from the 2.2 microhenry inductor, it's running at 800 kilohertz. As we'll find out later, it's also fully visible on the I2C bus. Then we have a lithium ion battery level gauge, which is also visible on I2C. A bunch of MOSFETs, buzzer, infrared, Gesture sensor based on the popular APDS9960, a 6 DOF IMU with gyro and accelerometer with I2C interface, MEM style microphone based on the mic 3722, which I couldn't find any data sheets on. Flipping over to the underside, we have external speaker and mic input connector, a nice M2 slot, which is starting to be critical on SBCs these days, and LiPo battery connector. From the semi side, we have an auto switching power mux, which is used to power up the board when receiving a wall ethernet packet. And uh, okay, a bodge wire. I guess as far as bodge wires go, it's a pretty neat job. And then we have another common part, the ALC5651 stereo audio codec, providing record and playback of audio at 24 bits and up to 192 kilohertz. LDO providing a steady 3.3 volts at up to 500 milliamps, which powers the SD card. Logic level converter for the debug UART console. And I'm pretty sure this is a plain old op amp, I think. So all up, it's a pretty interesting SBC, but let's see what it can actually do. The RK3399 can get pretty hot under the collar when running all six cores. So a heatsink is absolutely essential. Unfortunately, Cadis sent me the wrong heatsink, so I had to resort to my Uber heatsink for thermal tests. Also, since we have an M2 key slot, I'll be using one of my NVMe based SSDs for tests. I'll also be tracking power consumption using a handy power logger. Booting up was an interesting experience. Theoretically, I should be able to power the board from either of the USB ports or DC jack. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get the board to power up using the DC jack. Once again, this is a pre-release SBC, so I'll investigate what the problem is and let Cadis know. So I'll be powering the board from USB Type-C instead. 
Once powered up, the Edge booted straight into Android from the onboard eMMC. So while I'm here, I might as well check out the Android performance. The image came with the Antutu benchmark pre-installed, so I fired that up. As you can see, the results weren't stellar, placing it on the bottom of all devices with an Antutu benchmark score of 37,725. One of the reasons was due to the fact that the CPU is being throttled a fair amount. Using my laser thermal sensor showed up that the CPU temperature was being kept around 52 degrees Celsius, with the hottest part being the gigabit ethernet transceiver. So like all my other RK3399 based SBC reviews, you definitely need some active or passive cooling for this sock. Time for my Uber heatsink. Rerunning the benchmark came up with a much better result of 97,229. This stopped the CPU throttling and brought the overall board temperature down a fair amount to a little over room temperature. So on to upgrading the SBC to Linux. To reflash the firmware, you have to put the SBC into upgrade mode. There are several ways of doing this. You can press and hold the function key while pressing the reset button or via the debug serial port from the Linux command line or pressing the function button three times within two seconds of boot or short circuit two pads on the board while pressing the reset button. Once you enter upgrade mode, the power light turns blue and starts to flash. However, while the edge was connected to the main board, I never got the first method to work. The second, third and fifth methods were also unavailable as you can only get to the M register pads and serial port from underneath, which you can't get to when attached to the captain. The fourth method seemed to be the most reliable and you should see the upgrade screen appear. Once you have it in upgrade mode, you can upgrade via SD card or USB type C. I first tried to upgrade using the SD card method as this was the easiest. Cadus have some pretty decent documentation on how to do this. However, I never managed to get the SD image creation tool working with several SD cards. So I decided to upgrade over USB Type-C instead of SD card using a Linux notebook. I pulled the git repo and since I had Debian and not Ubuntu, a bit of fiddling fixed the install script. Once you have the image downloaded and the tool functioning, time to plug it into the notebook for upgrading. But this is where the magic smoke genie appeared. I used the Latte Panda power pack to power the edge via one of the USB Type-C connectors. But as soon as I plugged in the second USB Type-C port to my notebook, the gentle sound of electronics frying could be heard. I haven't yet investigated why this happened. I know that the Latte Panda power supply was providing 12 volts to the USB port, but theoretically that 12 volts shouldn't be backfed onto the second port. So I'll dig around a little bit more and provide an update later on. Anyway, so I then disconnected the board from the Latte Panda power supply and powered it directly from the USB port on a Windows notebook. Following the CADIS documentation, I installed the software and burnt the Linux image to eMMC. Once booted, I started to poke around to see what was available on the default image. Yep, all six CPU cores are there, nice to see. Unfortunately, no SPI, but there's ITC. GPIOs are all there, and you have access to CPU frequency and temperature. Like all my other SPC reviews, I set the CPU scaling governor to performance mode. The 128 gig NVMe SSD was visible along with the eMMC. On the temperature side, I saw a very similar story. While idle, it was regularly hitting 70 degrees Celsius. And adding my Uber heatsink saw the temperature drop down to 30 degrees. The default Linux image only has four ITC buses enabled with only a handful of devices visible on the first two. 
ITC bus 9 is the HDMI port and bus 10 is the DP port. Don't bother trying to query devices on this bus as it will lock up your board. During testing I'd often see the board slow down to a crawl. It turns out that the HDMI port starts to hammer the CPU with interrupts. So simply disconnecting HDMI and plugging it back in fixes it. Looking at this schematic and probing around a bit, I managed to figure out the following ITC device map. The ones marked U are unavailable for the user and have a Linux kernel driver accessing them. But based on the schematic, I'm missing two more ITC devices, the audio codec and IMU. Since there are actually nine ITC buses on this SOC, I needed to enable some of the other buses. So I enabled a couple that I guessed were the right ones using the device tree compiler and rebooted. And now bus one and seven have the two remaining devices. Looking at the datasheet for both, I quickly found that the audio codec was on bus one and the IMU on bus seven. I set a few registers to enable the IMU and was able to query the temperature fairly easily. And yep, cooling the sensor down responds without issue. GPIO tests were also successful and GPIOs run at 3.3 volts. I'm not sure if they are 5 volt tolerant though. I wasn't able to test out the infrared as there's currently no documentation on how to get to it. Also note that the SOC has GPIOs that can perform many functions, so you often get clashes based on how the device tree is configured. For example, if you want SPI, then you'll miss out on some of the UARTs. So there's always a bit of a trade-off. However, as expected, Ethernet speeds were pretty decent, with 937 megabits per second on TCP throughput and 0.43 milliseconds UDP jitter. Now unfortunately I wasn't able to test any further because of the Magic Smoke Genie and only just started to install all the software for the Pharonix tests. But I did notice that the old issue of Ethernet lockups is still occurring with the RK3399 kernel driver. This just causes the board to crash with a kernel dump. So what do I think of the new Cadis Edge and Captain? If you are worried about whether the product actually exists on the Indiegogo campaign or not, well, I can say it actually does. It's still early days, but from what I've seen so far, they're set to make a pretty decent product. If you get the correct heatsink, then both the Edge and Edge 5 comes in a fairly small package. And it's good to see that they have designed in some decent power management. USB Type-C is very quickly being adopted and will solve all the power related issues that we have been seeing in SPC so far. Even though it's slightly more complex to implement, it gives you a more stable DC supply. That's about it for part one of this video. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to hit subscribe to be notified when I publish part two. And if you want to support this channel further, you can join the bunch of really cool patrons I have over at Patreon. So thanks for watching and see you next week.